Carmen Emerson was our intern here in the school year 2009 to 10, in that year of economic uncertainty. I wonder, how many of you were here then? And how many not here yet? So, half and half or so. Carmen came to us well prepared for ministry by many years of lay leadership in her congregation in Orlando, Florida, as well as a career in business and her seminary education. She was on the planning team that worked on the Capital Fund Drive, which bought us this building, uh, this sanctuary. She was also that year a pastor to the staff. It was a very hard year for the staff. She was ordained by this congregation in the summer of 2010. She left us to serve the UU congregation in Meadville, Pennsylvania, which she did for five years. She's now starting her third year at the newer of our two congregations in Nashville, Tennessee. Carmen's the fourth of our interns to return this summer. It has been such fun, and it's great having you back, Carmen. Welcome. Before I begin, I'm going to do a little fashion show of my stole. I always felt like if I needed to hide, I could stand in front of the mural and disappear. <laughs> but what I told Christine as we began is that any time I have a hard sermon to preach, guess which stole I reach for? This one. Good morning, First Unitarian Albuquerque. What a pleasure to return to your pulpit to be with you in this beautiful sanctuary celebrating your many years of ministry with Christine Robinson. Seven years ago, I spent a year with you. I want you to know, Christine and congregation, that that year is imprinted upon my heart as a journey of discovery, an evolution of becoming, as we made our way together through a particular frontier, one described by poet David White in this way. Human beings are always and always will be a frontier between what is known and what is not known. Journeys into that particular human frontier, that wild and untamed landscape between what we know and what we do not yet know, those are journeys best made with companions that we come to trust with the cumulative evolution of our very selves. Consider some of the great companion journey stories that we love. For example, Mr. Frodo had Samwise Gamgee to teach him about being small yet mighty, to teach him about going forth to do what must be done even when you are afraid. The little prince had the fox to teach him about commitment and responsibility and integrity. Luke Skywalker had Yoda to teach him about, well, everything that you need to know to become the person you're called to be. If one is truly fortunate, they get not just a single companion, but a whole team of companions to be with them on their frontier journey. Dorothy had the scarecrow, the tin man, and the lion to teach her about being thoughtful and compassionate and courageous. In more recent companion stories, Peter Quill's Space Lord has Rocket and Gamora, Drax, and of course, Groot, right, to teach him about humor and trust, true strength and devotion. In my frontier year of discovery and evolution with you, I had Christine and an intern committee, Kathy Foy, Mary Colton, Leanne Boone, Doug Francis, Tom Benefil, and also all of you who were willing to teach me all of those things I mentioned above, willing to be in a relationship with a minister who was going to be here and then gone, one more in the lineage of ministry of this congregation and Reverend Christine Robinson. So I learned many things from you. I learned many things from Christine. I have 18 minutes, so I'm only going to cover two of them this morning. The two that have held me most steady over the past seven years of ministry. The first thing is understanding the connections between risk and wisdom. The second thing is understanding the connections between fear and faith. 
So the first lesson about risk and wisdom came before I was actually your intern. It was our UA General Assembly 2008 in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and as you may remember, Christine delivered the prestigious Berry Street Lecture that year, Imagineering Soul. Do you remember that? It was brilliant and inspiring. So my interview was with Christine and Ron Hersom and Alicia Hawkins, that was the interview team. It was scheduled for the morning after Christine had delivered the Berry Street Lecture. We were to meet at 8.30 at the Convention Center and then make our way to the exhibit hall, try to find a quiet corner of the exhibit hall to do the interview. So I met them as planned and we began walking toward the exhibit hall. But everyone who had heard Christine kept stopping her. So it's really more accurate to say we began this group lurch toward the exhibit hall. So many had been inspired by her. They just needed to stop and tell her what the things she said had meant to them. She was gracious. I was anxious. This was a hot internship, and I knew from conversations among my fellow seminarians that several of them were also scheduled to interview. I wanted time to make the best impression I could make and to convey just how serious I was about getting this internship. Eventually, we made it to our quiet table in the corner, and I did my best to make a good impression. Following the interview, I wrote a thank you note to Christine. Now, a word about this thank you note. It was the most earnest thank you note in the history of thank you notes, <laughs> written from corner to corner, margin to margin, on only the most worthy Hallmark greeting card. I wanted this internship so badly, was so certain that this was just exactly the right place for me, I was compelled to send my epic thank you note just in case that had not been clear during our interview. So I sent my note, and I waited. And after an almost appropriate waiting time, when I had not heard anything, I called Christine, with who politely and firmly, as is sometimes her way, let me know that a decision would be forthcoming. And because an internship is a required part of our fellowship process, and because the clock was ticking, and because I'm a very practical person, I made arrangements for an interview with the second congregation. All the travel arrangements were made. I was thoughtful about interviewing with that congregation, had considered how to best answer them when they asked me, why us? What is it you hope to learn from us and with us? And the day before I was scheduled to fly to that interview, Christine called to offer me the internship here. I was happily confused. When I shared that I had another in, uh, interview commitment with a second congregation, Christine did not miss a beat. Well, of course, you must go, she said. You must go, because as certain and determined as you are about becoming an intern in Albuquerque, we actually may not be the right place for you. You should go there. Find out what you don't know that you may need to know to make this decision. You may discover that they are an even better place for you. That thought had never crossed my mind, but now there it was, and there we stood together on that frontier of knowing and not knowing. So I went to the interview at that second congregation. I brought them my best. I was really open-minded and open-hearted about all that they had to offer. And the truth is, it would have been a good internship. But I wanted a great internship. After returning home, I called that congregation, thanked them sincerely, and asked them, please, to remove me from consideration for their internship. There was discernment, there was an evolution of knowing and not knowing and then knowing better. And what I knew was that Christine and this congregation were exactly the right combination of companions to trust on that frontier journey of ministerial formation. I call Christine to say, my heart is still with Albuquerque. And she said, come. Christine encouraged me to risk uncertainty on balance with my certainty, to risk not yet knowing with all that I thought I knew. It was exactly the right counsel and advice. She's good at that. 
To risk uncertainty, to dwell with the anxiety of not knowing is the beginning of wisdom. And that's the connection between risk and wisdom. To dwell with the anxiety of not knowing is the beginning of wisdom. Teach all the sages, including our sage. Now, wisdom is expected of ministerial leaders, but anxiety is not, and that is another layer of learning that I got from Christine, to be aware of one's own anxieties, especially when they are an expression of our deepest fears. Two conversations stand out for me, one early in our year together and one towards the end, and both relate to the fears and anxieties of being enough as a minister. In one of our first supervision sessions, I asked Christine how she managed to remember all the names of all of her 750 members. She gave me a look. I was to become very familiar with that look over the next year. And since she's leaving anyway, I think it's okay to share what she said. I don't remember 750 names, she told me. In fact, I don't know every one of the 750 people who are here. So my surface level anxiety was immediate relieved. Great, I don't have to remember 750 names. But this question that was coming from my deeper fear remained, if I do not intimately know every single person in the congregation that I'm going to serve, how can I think of myself as their minister? How can I know that I'm gonna be a good minister for that congregation. I was naively thinking as a friend rather than as a ministerial leader, and those things are different. I erroneously believed that to be an effective and good minister, I would need to know everyone and everything. When I confessed this deep fear to Christine, she responded with the most important truth of my ministry. You don't have to know everything. In fact, you cannot know everything. You are one person and you will never be as smart as the whole congregation of people that you face. You will not have their knowledge. You will not have their experiences. You just can't know everything. Whatever the size of your congregation, even if it's not 750 people, you can't know everything. If you try to be everything to everybody, you will fail and you will be disappointed. Be who you are. Be the minister you are. Discover your gifts, hone your skills, engage in discernment so that you can trust yourself. Keep your mind on the important stuff, pay attention, attend your strong leaders, know that you will continue evolving as a minister and know that that will be enough. In other words, have a little faith, Reverend. And of course, over the year, I watched Christine be an amazingly effective and great minister, even though she did not know 750 names. I just learned by watching her do what she is so good at doing. As much as I would like to tell you that this enough is greater than everything affirmation took immediate root, the truth is that it was a theme revisited often during my year with Christine and this congregation. Even towards the end of our year together, Christine encouraged me to examine my habit of always, quote, adding a worry. I still remember where we were in her office. We had been talking about something, and it was all good stuff. And then I did my usual thing, but what if? And she said, why must you always add a worry? <laughs> so in other words, have a little faith and don't miss the joy, Reverend. Because we know. Faith and joy are both essential to healthy ministers and healthy ministries. Faith and joy sustain us, call us back from the edge of despair, enable us to make a difference in the lives of one another and in the larger community that we serve. We each and all sustain one another in these efforts of living our shared values with integrity. In its most distilled essence, our shared work is choosing to tip the scales towards more life rather than let them tip towards more death. And that's the amazing and I would say holy work that we get to do together as Unitarian Universalists.
as ministers and congregations together. It is a work that begins when we dare to ask, what if we, or when we dare to declare, you know, we should. It's work that continues when we say, I'm willing to try this. It's work that continues when we say, I, I can do this part. It is work best done together and most effectively with trusted companions who have the will for the work. In my year as your intern, I heard, what if we invested in solar panels on our sanctuary roof? That was huge. That was a very exciting thing that happened during my year with you. And then I heard, what if we build a new sanctuary? And then I heard, we should plan a capital campaign. And then I heard from many individuals in this congregation, yes, and I can do this part, and I can do this part, and I can do this part. Even though you were worried about the economy, you dared to dream this big what if, and faith eclipsed your fear. Your responses to the many we shoulds and what if we's, despite all the unknowns where I can, I can commit my time, my talent, my treasure to our collective efforts in this way. And no, everyone could not do everything, but everyone seemed to do something for the good of the whole, a choice to tip the scales toward life. Engaging with companions you trust, one another and your minister. Witnessing that, experiencing that was a profound lesson. So thank you all for helping me understand at the deepest levels that a discerning faith and true joy are essential to good ministry. Thank you, congregation, especially for creating a safe place for me to witness, to learn, and to practice the ministry of tending to life with faith and joy. Thank you all for having the will for our holy work. And just in case you think this has just been a sweet little trip down memory lane, I want you to know I am not just witnessing to the year that was. I am witnessing to the ministry that is in Nashville. You see, I am now exactly where I need to be, back in the Deep South, living in Tennessee after fleeing, and I mean fleeing, rural Arkansas 40 years ago with certainty, there I go again, being certain, with certainty that I would never ever return to the South. I was disheartened by its racist culture, its resignation to poverty. There I felt powerless, too invisible to make a difference, and therefore ashamed. And the truth is, I would never have had the courage to go back to the South without all that I learned from being with you. Lessons of risk and wisdom lessons of fear and faith, lessons of worry and joy, and all of them evolving into lessons about the possibilities inherent to shared ministry when we dare together to live our values by words and deeds that help tip the balance towards life, towards a good life. That is your legacy. Racism and poverty, of course, are still real and present systemic oppressions embedded in South Southern culture. That has not changed, but I have been changed. I no longer feel invisible or powerless or ashamed or despairing. Returning to the South did not return me to those states of mind or heart. Having been here, I can never go back there. I cannot do or know everything, but I know that I am enough to lead my small and mighty congregation in saying, what if we, and we should, and we can, and I can. Even amidst our collective and individual fears and worries, all the challenges, all that is beyond our control, I believe with all my heart that we together are capable of the work of tipping the scales towards life, it is good to be their minister. Thanks to you, I have faithfully, joyfully gone south by Southwest. <laughs> and it is good to be home. Thank you.